someone who has never prayed before to please pray today. So, is there anyone who hasn't prayed in this class? Seems like most people have prayed. Uh, but, uh, hope, hope hasn't play, uh, prayed before. <laughs> Oh, hope has it. Okay, you're keeping account of that, no, Charles. Okay, so uh, yeah, hope. Uh, would you be able to lead us in prayer today? Can I pray? Okay. Okay. Fine, Charles. You volunteered. Hope, <laughs> but I. Not, uh, let, let me stand in for hope. Father God, we thank you so much sure, sure. for this wonderful morning. God of gods and King of kings, we thank you because you love us. And now, Lord, that we are here before you, as we can prepare to learn about the local church, Lord, we pray that you will teach us because we are your bride. The church is your bride. The church is the one that you came for. And you will be coming back to take your church home. So, Lord, prepare us. Help us learn from you that as we are here this morning, we feel so expectant that, Lord, you will give us the expectations we have about you and be ready to be led by you as we continue to live on earth in preparation for eternity. We thank you, we love you. For in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles. Thank you for leading us in that word of prayer. Uh, we've been studying about the local church and in the last class we looked at the uh, the structure and church government and uh, 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 the way it progressed in the uh, early uh, church. So after doing that, you know, we, we saw that there were uh, several roles that emerged, some at the level of administration initially. So we had uh, deacons uh, and then, you know, we eventually had uh, elders in the church uh, and then Later on, we saw the role of a bishop uh, emerging and then uh, the bishop who is also, you know, in the spiritual ministry, not just the, the administrative uh, and logistic side of things, but also in spiritual ministry. We saw the emergence of uh, pastors, the emergence of uh, senior pastors, one pastor being assigned to a local church. So in this manner, church government um, took shape uh, and we kind of compared it to our present day structure here in uh, you know present the current church and we said that uh, in terms of the government different churches as led by god uh, have a structure which is suitable for them okay uh, and we looked at uh, styles of governing and we discussed some of the common uh, patterns that people use so we had done most of the uh, types of church government, uh, but we have a few more to touch on. So we'll do that today, and then we will proceed to the next uh, chapter here. So I think we were at uh, house churches, and we talked about the importance of uh, fellowship, the importance of connecting deeply with other believers, and house churches provide that opportunity. Uh, and in uh, today's time, a lot of churches do not want to get into more of an event management uh, mode. So they prefer the house churches and maybe once in a while they have a large gathering where uh, the entire congregation can join in. Uh, but one challenge of house churches is the, the uh, issue of uh, oversight because if you have leaders who have caught into the vision and they are well equipped they're all flowing together it's all right but if you find some of the leaders um, 
taking the church in their own direction and not reporting it to the uh, leadership of the church, then it can be problematic, right? So uh, what we call as uh, splinter groups. So you can have certain groups that break away from the main vision, that break away from the main church, uh, and that can be problematic. So that's about the house churches. Now, cell-based churches, I'm on page uh, 24 in our notes. Uh, and cell-based churches are, um, it's similar uh, in a sense. Uh, however, it, it's not exactly house churches. So cell-based churches are, uh, they could be mega churches, they could be large churches. But what they have done is they have, um, they have, provided this option to the people to be connected in smaller groups. Now, the, the connecting in the smaller groups can uh, be done in various ways. Uh, in some churches, they may want to regroup people based on their age group, or uh, in some churches, they prefer to do it on the basis of people's interests. Um, in some churches, they may do it on the basis of uh, ministry interests. So you know, there are different ways of grouping people within a congregation uh, and they allow people to connect in smaller groups uh, and these smaller groups have a rhythm. The rhythm uh, establishes, you know, uh, an op it gives them an opportunity to connect more often than your, um, uh, your Sunday service and the larger meetings. They establish strong relationships here. They can develop accountability. They can also study God's word. They could pray together. They could uh, become those groups that catch the vision of the church and you know, serve in their own capacity. So cell groups, uh, the cell group model is a very, very um, effective model. We will be looking at it a little later as well. Uh, but for now, you know, we, we can know that this model exists and some of the uh, largest churches in the world they have cell groups uh, in them and it's been um, a great contributor for the growth of the church so cell groups are good uh, and cell groups also have uh, the downside of splinter groups uh, coming out of them if the leaders of the cell groups are not in sync with the rest of the elders and the pastoral team of the church so that uh, could, that is a danger but of course you know if you if you have a system where where uh, you can provide proper oversight uh, uh, to these cell groups and uh, keep the cell group leaders in sync uh, cell groups can work very well so that's uh, another structure uh, that is common Mega churches. Mega churches are uh, uh, the emerging model, also, uh, so to speak. We see so many mega churches. Uh, the mega churches are known for the uh, number of people that attend these churches, and you know the Sunday services are more like an event, and uh, you know it's it's pretty well done. It's pretty well done. So mega churches, how? We could sort of classify them as 2,000 plus members. Uh, and the advantage of uh, a mega church is uh, that the mega church has a voice. It has a, it has a voice. Uh, it could have a voice in the city. Uh, it could also have a voice for the nation. It could have a, an international voice. Just by the sheer size of the church and the the capabilities, right? The resources that they they have. Um, once when they speak, people take notice. So the influence of a mega church uh, is is uh, tremendous, and you know that can be used for God's glory. Um, and organizationally, uh, you know, generally we find that mega churches are, are pretty good, uh, and this could be because of the kind of leadership that is provided. Usually, if you notice mega churches, they will have a strong visionary leader who is also good organizationally. Okay? So this leader could have founded the church and eventually we could have developed uh, a pastoral team, we could have developed ministry teams. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a good structure provided to the church. So it's sort of easier to go through the rhythm uh, of the mega church uh, 
you know the the life of the mega church so uh, that is the the uh, way in which mega churches are generally established uh, and uh, they they do well they do pretty well now the downside of the mega churches could be the lack of fellowship so uh, you know people come into the church but if there's organizationally there's no way of tracking them if there's no way of uh, 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 getting to know them quickly uh, and and getting them into cell groups or things like that, then people might feel disconnected uh, quite soon. So people come in, yes, and people might also leave. So that is a challenge here in a mega church, and you know, uh, uh, doing this well, connecting people well in a mega church, it's easier said than done. It is very difficult. It is very difficult unless the uh, the church has established great systems early on if they have established those systems then you know probably uh, people come in and they quickly connect uh, and, and they still are able to uh, grow and feel um, loved and blessed at an individual level okay so that is possible uh, however if it's not well done like organizationally if there are challenges uh, then uh, you know it's difficult people might feel left out now the other a challenge it's not a downside now we said that a mega church can have a voice because uh, of the way things are done but if something goes wrong in a mega church okay for example uh, if uh, the funds are not utilized properly or if there is a moral failure uh, you know or if the pastor has a moral failure or the somebody in the pastoral team uh, shows issues it's picked up very quickly okay it's picked up very quickly and the news spreads and that can have a negative impact on the people now it's not to say that smaller churches don't have these issues smaller churches can also have these issues but uh, i'm talking about the impact the, the quick and the large impact that uh, a mega church can have you can't compare it with what a, a small church the impact from the small church so that again is uh, is something to um, you know take notice of uh, and it's possible that mega churches also have a lot of media attention so you know if they say something um, which is unacceptable to the to the media the press or you know the the government they can get into trouble quicker so these are the the uh, challenges of mega church and also we know that it is a it is a good thing that you know god um, wants churches to be large okay? so there's no there, it, it's not again it's not, we're not talking about right or wrong uh, but there's good in everything there can also be downsides the point is to go in the direction that the lord is leading you and uh, we will discuss later it's, it's okay to uh, trust god for our church to become a mega church because there are so many people who need to hear the good news and uh, uh, why can't we have you know large churches every church grows and every church becomes a a, a large place that can uh, that that can nurture and disciple people okay so uh, yeah mega churches are a good option now moving on to the next uh, kind of church setup that exists the multi site churches uh, multi site churches um, uh, are also kind of coming to the fore lately uh, and uh, that these are also uh, preferred by people the reason being uh, they're geographically accessible for people right so in a city uh, if there's a wonderful church in the heart of the city and the city is the large uh, uh, in in terms of you know distances and all of that uh, people may find it difficult to go to that particular branch so if you have multiple branches people can uh, be part of the life of the church they can learn from the teachings of the church they can be discipled by the church wherever they live they don't have to travel uh, uh, you know far into the center the heart of the city each time to be a part of the church so multi site churches are uh, uh, coming up and a lot of people prefer this now uh, the structure of the multi site churches usually you have the senior pastor but you have a good pastoral team unless you have a good pastoral team uh, it's difficult to run this because you know you 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 must be in sync you need to have that rhythm uh, you know together with with the other 
members on your team. So as uh, the senior pastor directs, the pastoral team can uh, sort of uh, flow and uh, you can have the churches running simultaneously, good oversight being provided uh, to the churches. Uh, and uh, in a multi-site church, one of the, the common features is share, sharing of resources. Okay, so a lot of things could happen centrally, like uh, centrally uh, people might decide what the themes of the sermons will be uh, in the upcoming months. Uh, centrally, there can be a plan for member care. Centrally, there can be a lot of other you know ministries that are launched out and the branch churches kind of feed into that. So shared resources is a common feature of multi-site churches. So all these options exist. Uh, there, are, uh, there, there are strengths, there are weaknesses, uh, and definitely there is no perfect church, okay? Uh, and uh, we, we have to do our best to be led by the Spirit of God uh, and move in the direction that God has for us. So some of you uh, might be pastoring churches uh, so please bear this in mind you could go with any structure you could go with any structure but uh, be aware of the downsides so then you know how to plug the loopholes from the very beginning now uh, any questions any comments that uh, you would like to add to what we are discussing today yes uh, samuel please yeah go ahead you could uh, unmute and ask Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Uh, well, I I yeah. feel um, you know for those of us who um, long to start churches, I think knowing yeah. these different types of churches uh, is really important. Um, but I also feel um, you know um, st like strategically, like um, yeah. it has it has some significance. Like for example, you know um, if I want to have huge impact let's say if i want to impact uh, my state uh, my city uh, but uh, the format that i'm comfortable with is uh, say of yeah. a cell based church okay so that that's a conflict in itself so I'll, I'll probably not be so effective in having a huge impact like probably i should have a format that is more um, scalable to a mega church. Uh, mm. That's what I should aim for. Mm. Uh, so I'm thinking um, how many pastors out there or, or people who start church have a vision in mind and then uh, structure the church according to the vision versus, you know, uh, like we start, I think you know, the, the very natural way to go is um, you want to start a church, you start a church, uh, but you're not really thinking about structures and it sort of organically takes place. You grow and grow and grow and grow. So from a cell base, you become a house church to uh, uh, probably uh, an independent church. Then then you realize that you need to put some uh, some leadership in place. And then probably and then again, depending on um, on your leadership team, then uh, there's potential of becoming a mega church but then uh, is there a possibility that you know you become a mega church and then you re you realize that uh, it's not aligned to the vision and somehow you want to uh, dial down or you want to you know uh, you want to stick to uh, self because you realize that you know you started the church in the first place so that people have close fellowship with each other you know, and yeah. somehow uh, you are, you're not really focused about impact, having a huge, big scale impact, but you are like more like, um, at least that's what I'm thinking. Like I, if I want to have a church, I want to have it in small numbers where, you know, very small congregation, but the congregation, they know each other very well. Um, and uh, let's say I want to stick with that. Uh, but uh, I, because I haven't, so, so I, I think I'm just, uh, my bigger question is, uh, strategically planning versus uh, letting it organically grow into uh, uh, depending on uh, so how, how like do you measure like I don't know I, I don't know if I'm making sense but I, I no see no no I, I, I get what you're saying yes yes Samuel I do I get what you're saying yeah, so any any comments thoughts on that Okay, thank you, uh, Samuel. It's a really good question for um, any pastor. Uh, and I would say it's a combination. You can't have one or the other. Okay, so uh, yeah, because we begin the church with a vision for sure. Uh, and 
we must have a, a, a strategy in place. Okay. But then if you ask any pastor who has pioneered a church over the years, they will tell you uh, there was the broad vision and uh, uh, there was the strategic plan, but they had to make place for the organic growth as well. So there's a lot of tweaking. There's a lot of um, accommodating growth uh, that happens. There is there is a transitioning that happens. So a pastor, uh, yes, we put the structure down, uh, uh, you know, on, on a piece of paper as the Lord gives it to us. But I know for a fact that, you know, uh, things evolve as, as you keep moving forward. Okay. So mm. certain yeah, so it, it definitely happens, but we mustn't compromise on the uh, like the big ticket items. Like at least you need to know clear cut, you know, um, some some aspects of your church which wouldn't change. Okay, um, mm. okay. How how do I put that? Now, for example, your um, like you know your uh, statement of faith that sure. remains the same, right? So that has to remain the same. Your mission has to remain the same. If you're going to, to be uh, like APCWO, uh, All People's Church World Outreach, uh, and the name was given when everything began. So at mm -hmm. day one, right? So uh, the vision remains the same. And also the mission, we will talk about these things later. So mission is you need to know like what are your, your, your uh, uh, main approaches so if you are about reaching the uh, the unsaved people all right doing a small cozy connected church it's good but it will always growing the people will always tend towards encouraging them to step out at some point okay mm. so things like that so if you have some of the core um your your core aspects in place uh, that helps but then things will evolve organically you have to provide space for that and uh, from time to time you may also want to make some changes okay for example i'll just tell you uh, like if you choose a certain cell model there are many cell models out there uh, you know if, if you study various churches there are different cell models now, you may start off with one cell model and realize uh, that at this point, the church is rather small and you don't really need cell groups. It's, it's mm. going okay. So you might want to discard it altogether for a couple of years uh, till such time that you have more people in the church. Uh, and then you might come across a different cell model that suits your congregation. And then you kind of, you know, put that in place. But one uh, a point that I want to make right away is whatever you plan for your church, plan long term. Mm. Okay, so if you incorporate a certain cell model, uh, think of ask the question in the next 10 years, you know, will this model help disciple the people and grow the church? Mm. Right, so at least, I and mean, I'm just giving you a decade as a, as a uh, okay. scale here. But you could you could plan you know way ahead. You could plan way ahead, and when you ha when you're able to plan into the future, right? Uh, I I think that's very important for a leader to be able to plan like well into the future, and it helps the church because then you minimize those many uh, you know transitions and all. I mean, if you can avoid it, yes. But of course, you you will definitely have transitions happening from time to time. You can't. You can't change that. Thank so you. Thank just some examples. Yeah. Um, just one small thing. Um, but uh, yes, sir. You know, as you were answering, so it got me thinking. Um, uh, I think the default is for any any person starting a church. The default is growth. You know, mm. you want you want growth, the growth, and um, you know, somehow um, I don't know. I think most churches aim for a larger congregation and mm. probably multi-site churches and having, you know, branches all over. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if there are churches uh, that you know of which have, uh, you know, which have 
uh, taken the other route, which is, uh, you know, we will we will keep ourselves as house churches, or we will even if we are growing, we will probably uh, you know call it a different church and let the like let's say, uh, I'm, I'm hypothetically just let's say you and I start a church, um, and then we have uh, say 16 of us here. Uh, uh, but after two three years, uh, we become hundred, and then we decide to split. So you and so you all you 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 lead a separate church, and I lead, and then that becomes fifty church like church of two fifty fifty each, and then again. So it's not really th- these churches. I mean, even though they originated from the same uh, model, but now they are two independent churches, uh, and and so on. So I, I don't know if that. There is a model like that. Uh, and yeah, so it happens, Sam. It happens. It's I I don't, uh, I wouldn't call it a model, but I know that these kind of things happen, uh, and they happen quite often. Okay. Okay. So yeah. It's an intentional split, not not like you know. There's a dispute or conflict, but it's like we're just too big. Uh, yeah. I I and and I don't think we are having close fellowship. The congregation is too big to manage, so let's call yeah. ourselves two different churches. Okay. And so, the the uh, do you know of churches that? Okay. So personally, I don't know of churches that grow and split uh, for effectiveness, but I do know that cell groups do this. So mm. in a given church, uh, like even at APC, uh, we we incorporate the G12 model of uh, Caesar Castellino's uh, church uh, uh, and uh, the G12 model uh, is where you grow right mm. you grow up to 12 people and then you kind of split interesting okay mm. you split but then there, there are other dynamics like the cell group leader uh, can be a part of two cells so you can mm. be a part of that mother cell and then another cell group as well uh, if he would like to and uh, that way you know he can still have that fellowship with the earlier cell group so this is the original model but uh, you know it has kind of uh, evolved since then so just to adapt ourselves to the practicalities of Bangalore city so yeah I know that cell groups do that but uh, intentionally churches going in for things like growing and splitting I don't know of uh, a model like that, and uh, if you ask me, I think it's a, it's a. I mean, I don't know how you would manage that in the long term, because uh, you know, for people, it's for the pastors and all, it's okay, <laughs> but mm-hmm. for the people, if you tell them, okay, now you've had good fellowship, now we are hundred people, now split, it doesn't <laughs> work like that. Relationships don't work like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Thank but, you. Uh, sure. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Uh, okay. We have two more questions. We'll, we'll take that up. So Kennedy is asking, is there something like an online church? So yes, uh, Kennedy, recently I have observed uh, certain pastors and ministers who have launched only an organic, uh, sorry, online church. So uh, they physically they don't meet physically because these uh, the one particular church that I, I know of, uh, it's a global ministry. So they have people from all over the world attending the uh, teachings of uh, this minister of God. Uh, and, you know, they, they do it in a periodic way. Uh, and for, from what I have observed, when they have their services and the teaching is going on, at the end of the teaching, they actually announce members. And they would say uh, things like, okay, we have uh, Kennedy, uh, you know, I'm just saying like Kennedy from such and such a country and Nancy from this country who have become members, who have become members. So, uh, yes, there seems to be something like an organic, uh, why am I saying organic, Uh, online church happening. Uh, But then if you talk about the effectiveness of an online church, um, it's too... Mm, you know, it, it's too uh, initial to to make a comment on that because so many other things have to be answered. The question about how to disciple them, uh, what about um, you know meeting them in person, mentoring, counseling. So there are many aspects of discipling people. How how are we gonna uh, work on all those uh, aspects? You know, there are questions that need to be answered. But I have observed online uh, churches lately. Uh, where 
yeah they pe- people can't meet physically because it's global oh. unless they have a center where they invite people to come physically and meet and if they do that also how often can people buy an air ticket and go to another country to attend the church unless they have a pastoral team they send out ministers to different countries and plant you know churches physically in their zones so we'll have to wait and watch uh, how how this uh, pans out so uh, yes avni you had raised your hand you could go ahead please yeah ma'am uh, i'm just following up samuel's uh, question yes uh, uh, when the cities grow like huh. new localities come up okay so now the people are coming from far off and now they have shifted so now that is the reason where you know one another branch of the church can be opened like the church splits where you know i've seen uh, our local church back in our native where because a new locality in a far off in the same city but mm. outskirts they have now they started a church there and so many people from this church because they have opted to stay in that locality and made their houses there they start mm-hmm. going to that church so that can, can be one of the ways the church uh, you know uh, splits and uh, people are divided okay okay so uh, then the the hearts of the people are ready isn't it they are prepared to do this yes 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 okay. yeah then it's easier of me uh, yeah so if that is uh, taught to them and they are willing to do it it's good uh, but the point i was making is if if the splitting thing uh, is is the strategy of the church uh, it may not be easy you can prepare the people but if this is going to keep happening you grow up and then you split into you know one church becomes two churches uh, it may not be easy because you will have people of all kinds attending you know different personalities different mindsets so just to keep splitting may not be uh an easy thing to do so that that was the only minimum point that i was making yes ma'am thank you oh, yeah. so much sure thank you okay uh we will quickly take up a uh, few more questions here or oh, okay we have more questions uh yes so abraham says please is the church structure and administration the same okay so um abraham church structure is the uh it's like the blueprint that you have for for your uh, church ministry for example you have the senior pastor then there is a pastoral team and in the pastoral team you may want to have a um, you know a separation like you you have the uh, i mean apc model is like you have associate pastors now associate pastors uh, are serving in various capacities so uh, you know they oversee churches uh, they oversee uh, worship they oversee missions they uh, oversee children's church so in the pastoral team you have that whole spectrum of of uh, uh, you know oversight and then below that we have ministry leaders so ministry leaders you know uh, when it comes to workplace ministry there's a team uh, who who sort of runs that whole area of uh, uh, workplace ministry there's the the women's ministry so there's a team of people there who kind of take up the events associated with that and the work associated with that so there are the ministry leaders and then the cell group leaders so there is a structure as you can see it's a, it's like a blueprint so even as the church grows we might have additional uh uh roles additional areas of ministry that come up but the structure sort of remains the same you still have the senior pastor the pastoral team the ministry team the cell group leaders you know and so on and so forth okay so that would be a structure now administration administration is the uh, like you know your your systems your processes the the way you um take in people so these things that you establish for the working of your model that would be the administration aspect of it you know how you run it organizationally so that is the administration aspect i hope uh, it clarifies uh, something at this point ibrahim yes thank you so much bro okay sure thank you thank you ibrahim yes uh, we we have kennedy who had raised uh, his hand kennedy you can go first and then i think christopher has a question also Just to add on some, something what Sandra has asked. Yeah, 
I think there's a new trend where you find there are churches and there are very strong ministry ministries, like in the case of uh, the late TB Joshua. Okay? Ah. Uh, the Scone Church, then okay. he has his TB ministry, where okay. the ministry tends to overshadow mm. the, the, the church. Now, how would you mm. or how, where would you classify this kind of an organization? Okay, so uh, Kennedy has said you gave the example of TB Joshua and you said there is a church and there is a TV ministry. Yeah, you have a okay. church. Uh -huh. They have a strong ministry, you see. Like you feel like the John Hagen, they have a strong, strong ministry that tends to overshadow the church. Okay, like mm -hmm. in the case of TB Joshua, had the man then they had a strong mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Then he had a strong Ministry of TV, TV Joshua. Yeah, how okay. how do you grade this? Okay, so you're saying the uh, I, I'm trying to um, you know the get your question the actually. You know you have your own church, Nancy. Mm. Then you have Nancy Ministry, and mm. the ministry tends to watch the church. How would you grade this? Mm. Okay, fine. Well, uh, I get your question, uh, Kennedy. Yeah, I get your question. Okay, so uh, you see, uh, even though a lot of uh, pastors may not call uh, a, a certain ministry by name, it's it's actually happening that way. Okay, so uh, we we will come to that. Uh, I I don't know if we will touch. Yeah, maybe we will touch on it towards the end here. So uh, somebody who's in the role of a pastor, you know, the pastor's role is oversight, shepherding of the people. But that pastor might have an anointing, like a teacher pastor anointing. So uh, apart from just the oversight of the church, you know, God might uh, give that individual a ministry for the, uh, the nation or uh, different nations. So you might find that this pastor, he's overseeing the church, but he's also, you know, teaching. Uh, uh, he, he could be writing books, doing other things to equip people, uh, believers in the global body of Christ, which is actually all right. You know, which is okay. Because if God has graced that person to do two things, um, that individual will be able to do it. And there is really nothing wrong with that. Uh, now, yes, some pastors uh, like to call that that different ministry by another name. Okay, uh, maybe that's for organizational reasons. I don't know. Uh, but if you look at churches and pastors in general, I think it already happens, and there's nothing wrong with it because God gives you a grace to oversee your congregation. But at the same time. You, know, you could have an anointing, you could have an apostolic uh, anointing, a prophetic anointing, a teaching anointing, where you're doing more to equip the body of Christ. And that's that's perfectly fine. As long as, uh, you know, we are true to both the, the visions uh, that God has given us. Does, does that make sense, Kennedy? Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. What sure. what are, where would you... Would you grade it? What, what kind of category? Which you one? Know, the, the, Which why one? Why they have a combination? Why they have a combination? What I mean is uh -huh. strong. Right? It tends uh -huh. to overshadow the church. Like when uh -huh. you come so, to a ministry meeting, you get so many people at the attend. While when you look at the size of the congregation, it's smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that could happen. Um, uh, but you see. I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to judge that, uh, you know, that the ministry is doing better than the church. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, as long as the individual has been faithful and they're doing their best for both uh, the callings that God has for them, or rather the grace that God has for them, I think it's fine. It's very hard to uh, give that comparative comment that, Oh, how come this is growing and that is not growing? Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Yes, Kennedy. Thank you. Yes, Christopher, please, uh, you can ask your question. 
Uh, yes, Pastor. So last week, um, uh, there was a question on, uh, you know, what type of church was uh, APC church? Yeah. And um, I think broadly it was defined as uh, a non-denominational uh, church. Yes. Uh, that is from a, I think from a structural point of view. Yeah. And uh, maybe I'm going a little bit uh, beyond that. Mm. I just wanted to understand, is it um, aligned towards, you know, um, uh, an, an evangel uh, evangelical uh, church, um, uh, you know, based on, on the Bible and, uh, you know, being able to, uh, you know, I mean, the mission is to, you know, to evangelize and spread the word. Uh, is that is that what uh, APC is? Uh, I mean, uh, is that what what is APC? Yes, yes, uh, Christopher. Yeah, uh, yes. So uh, you you want to know in terms of the mission of the church, isn't it? Like what what yes. does the church want to do? Okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking. At... Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the mission of the church. Uh, see, it's a non-denominational church. We are Bible-based, uh, all right? And uh, uh, aspects of, uh, like, evangelism, uh, uh, discipleship, missions, all of this are a part of what we do because we go by the Bible, okay, the Word of God. So uh, we don't necessarily uh, classify ourselves, uh, you know, just with one name, like say we are evangelical or we are Pentecostal or we are, uh, you know, some other term you can use. So we, we try not to use those terms because otherwise what happens, like you're understood that you belong to a certain category. Okay. Uh, so we're just limiting ourselves to say, saying that, you know, we, we are a, we are a Bible based church. Uh, and I think, a good thing to do will be to go to, uh, yeah, I'm just getting the link for you. The statement of faith, which is on our website. Okay. Uh, and just have a look at that. Um, so yeah, we don't classify ourselves by any of the, any of the, um, what do you call it? Like, like categories. Okay, categories, uh, you can call mainline, Anglican, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, Pentecostal, Evangelical. So we don't put ourselves under any of that. We're just like, you know, based on the Bible. That's what I would say. And I, I don't know if there is a term uh, to use uh, for, for that. So would that actually uh, ah, yeah, come under a, 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 as a, uh, an independent church? Independent. Yeah, you could say so. We are independent. Yes, in terms of like organizationally, we are independent. Yeah, you can use that term. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. So uh, again, like when we say independent, right? Uh, all these terms have a certain definition and people understand it in a certain way. Uh, now, independent wouldn't mean that we are, we are not well connected to other ministers in the city or you know other ministries in the city. Uh, we do believe that for accountability, we must have good relationships with ministers and ministries in the city. Uh, so, you know, over the years, Pastor has tried to do that, and you know we, <coughs> as a team, believe in that, and we continue to uh, establish uh, uh, good relationships with other ministers of God. So, uh, yeah, independent doesn't mean that hey, you know, we are not accountable to anyone, uh, but we do believe in connecting with other ministers of God, and we let them speak into our lives as well. Okay, so just uh, an additional point over there. All right. Good questions, uh, everyone. It's good to think. Uh, generally, the first few chapters in uh, the, the House of God course end up, you know, taking more time because uh, the class wants to understand, uh, you know, how this works. So I'm happy that uh, you're not thinking. So uh, any other thoughts before we jump into 
the next uh, topic. Okay, great. So yes, we've understood that uh, churches can have different structures, uh, and uh, you know, based on the on the structure, God would help that particular church to um, disciple the people and at the same time have an impact uh, on the city and the nation. So if you look at church history, uh, you could, I mean, you can study it in depth. But we we don't uh, we don't want to get into it uh, you know in a deep way. Uh, but just going over the history, we've noticed that there has been a, a reformation in the church structure over a period of time. Uh, and uh, in the 1400s, you know, there was this restorative movement where uh, the theology that people believed in that uh, got transformed. So you have. Um, Martin Luther is one of the leaders uh, who helped people think differently. But uh, by around the 1400s, people were into indulgences, and you know there, there was a very huge division between those who uh, were uh, clergy and those who were laity. And the laity did not even know the Bible; they did not even read the Bible, and the concept of grace uh, was was not taught to them. But it was Martin Luther who came and he brought in a, a reformation. That's why it's called as a reformation um, in the knowledge uh, of uh, God. Okay, so so there was a reformation in theology, uh, and uh, because. You know, people were invited to read scripture and uh, and uh, develop their thought process. Uh, you know, eventually you you find that the way church was done kind of began to change. So in the 1800s, you find more of a reformation in terms of uh, the spiritual understanding of of things. So in the 1800s, you have moves of God where where healing movements took place and largely healing the understanding on healing uh, was transformed okay so uh, you know things changed in the in the body of Christ uh, and then you know, moving forward so you would hear more of uh, uh, meetings you would hear of you know large crusades you you would hear of tent meetings and things like that happening in the 1800s and then you know later on, uh, there, there was more like church and structure based um, uh, changes that kind of started emerging and that is still happening even till today you know we looked at various kinds and types and systems of of uh, uh, administration that that can take place in a church so it's still evolving and people usually tend towards whatever government is suitable for their uh, community of people now uh, this is important a good structure is important because you know uh, only then the church can grow uh, uh, and in the long term right you can equip people and these people can become mature and strong in the lord and they can go ahead and uh, uh, take part in the ministry that god has called them to do so uh, when we study the word of god you know we we learn that the saints are to do the work of god's ministry okay, this is in ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 so uh, the reason why god has established the fivefold ministry is to equip the saints to do their ministry so what we see happening on the earth now is people are aware that each one of them has a grace and a call okay now they everyone is not called to fivefold ministry offices but every believer is called to do something for the kingdom of god okay so the ministry is through the saints so currently you know there, there is more of equipping the saints that we talk about where every believer everyone who who is a part of church is growing uh, in God's word. It is growing in understanding their own ministry and stepping out in their own ministries. And this is done as uh, an integral part of a local body of, of God. Okay, So as a part of the local church. Now, every believer stepping out into ministry doesn't mean that you know they, they have to be separate from their local church. We can all be part of the local church, be accountable to one local church and still be serving in the capacity that God has called us to serve. So 
equipping the saints. And that's uh, uh, what we are seeing happen across the earth. Yeah. Uh, and we also notice that, you know, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, apostolic apostolic churches that are that are rising up so apostolic churches would mean that you know the the people grow to a place where uh, they then step out and they take the word of god around the world and they plant churches very similar to what you see happening in the early church okay? so there, there is that whole journey uh, that we've seen happen in church structure uh, and uh, if you look at you know, various forms of church structure uh, that still exist. Uh, you have denominational, non-denominational, uh, independent and all of that. Uh, but more and more, you know, the understanding of the apostolic seems to, uh, you know, we, we seem to be gaining that revelation uh, and uh, a lot of churches seem to be moving in that direction. Okay, So with that, uh, I will stop here. Let's take a break, 10 minutes. We are stopping now at... Uh, 9:52, so we will be back, uh, you know, at 10:02, and uh, continue from where we have left. Okay. See you soon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>